I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And it reads as follows. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. And then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. And the Philistine looked and saw David and disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy of a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted this day. The Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the bodies, the dead bodies of the armies of Philistines, this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Yes, and then it happened when the Philistines rose and came and drew near to meet David. That David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Verse 51, then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and reading of his word as we bow our heads in prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you, O God, for allowing us to be here one more time, O Lord. Father, we don't take it lightly that you have allowed us to assemble ourselves together, O God, to worship and to adore you and to celebrate your son, Jesus. Father, right now we ask that you open up hearts, that you open up minds, help us to hear what your word is saying to our lives, O God. Holy Spirit, as always, we ask that you speak to me and through me, O God. Let your people not hear me, Jesus, but you who live within me. I thank you right now for what you're going to do. And I give you glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may sit. So we are actually in a current sermon series called The Bible. And we are looking at certain stories in the scriptures to see how God has changed people's lives by them having faith in him. And today, as you saw, we're looking at David and Goliath. And if I had to put a title to this message, it would be, It's Not Your Fight. <laughs> it's not your fight. This morning, we find ourselves looking at a young man at a defining moment in his life. A moment in his life that pushes him over into his destiny. Everyone has defining moments. Everyone has a moment when they look back through hindsight, they say, it was that time, it was that moment in time that things changed in my life. Like it was that moment when my life was propelled forward to go towards certain things. Or was it that moment in my life when my life begins to be halted and I begin to be paralyzed by fear? And just like many of those moments, we don't know when those moments are, but we see it hindsight. But just like when we don't know, I believe in the scripture, David didn't know that this moment was a defining moment in his life. I believe he was just doing what was already in his heart. 
I believe he was just doing what God had placed him there to do. I believe he just wanted to declare the glory of God. Yes. Yes. This young man, a man by the name of David. Later in the scripture, we begin to know him as King David. King David, the warrior of God. King David, you know, the, the, the psalmist of the Lord. King David, who becomes the second king after King Saul to lead the nation of Israel. But yet in this time of scripture, we don't know any of that yet. In this time of scripture, we don't know really who David is. We see David comes to the scene back in chapter 16, and he's just this young shepherd boy who takes care of his father's sheep, a man by the name of Jesse. And he is the youngest of all of his father's children. He is the only one who is not listed on the greatest to achieve list in the house. When you look at the story closely back in chapter 16, you begin to see how God had chosen Samuel to go to Jesse's house and to anoint one of his kids to be the next king of Israel. And when he gets there, Jesse calls all of his boys in. All of them. They all come in except David. David can't be the one that God is about to anoint. David can't be, I mean, he is the runt of the family. Yes. He is the youngest, matter of fact, the boy is a shepherd. He cannot be the one that God is choosing to be the next king. Amen. Have you ever been looked over? Amen. Have you ever been forgotten? Oh, Have you ever been looked at as not the most valuable choice in the lineup? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But just because people have overlooked you. Yeah. Just because people have forgotten you. Come on. Just because people say, you know what, that is not the particular choice I would choose. That does not mean that God didn't choose. Yeah. It does not mean that God is not looking at you. Everybody else cannot look at you, but God is always looking yes. Yes. at you. Yes. Yes. God wants you. Yes. God chose you. Yes. Even though his family forgot about him, God didn't forget about him. God, I love God. He never leaves us, nor he never forsakes us. He remembers us. And when David comes into the room, Samuel, and Samuel sees him, God tells Samuel, that's the one. That's the one I'm choosing to be the next leader of Israel. And when David is anointed as a shepherd now, he's anointed as a shepherd as a teenager, but it's many years later before he becomes king. Yes. The process of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, the Bible says in verse, uh, 1 Samuel 16 and 13, listen to what it says. It says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And when the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, it left King Saul. Amen. And the Bible says how a, a spirit came from the Lord, an evil spirit came from the Lord, and began to torment Saul, terrorizing his mind. The Bible says how King Saul's servant comes to him and says, you know, you need to find someone who's able to play the harp, who can play music, and that way it can ease your mind. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's fascinating because the person they go and choose is David. Because right. it's a little teenage boy. Uh -huh. yeah. But when they begin to describe David in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 18, they say that David is a skillful musician. Right. And the Lord is with him. Man. Amen. God is orchestrating David's steps, yes. moving him to the past. Yes. Right. Do you know what the scripture says over in Psalms 37 and 23? That the steps of what? A good man Order. are ordered by the Lord. Yes. And I believe one of the ways that, that God is orchestrating David's steps is by using his gift, yes. using what he has developed. He was a skillful musician. He took his gift and he developed it and he began to master it. So that people began to seek him out for his gift. He took his ability to play the harp and he began to develop it and grow it to one day when someone of influence needed it, he said, go get that man. God used David's gift, as the Bible says, to make room for him. Yes. To bring him before influential men. Uh -huh. I, I want to encourage those in here who have a desire to be used by God. Right. If you really want to be used by God, uh -huh. develop your gift. Amen. You, you don't have to argue with fuck. Right. You don't have to get mad at people. Right. You don't have to manipulate people. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to do none of that stuff. Right. Just develop your gift. Right. 
And God will use your gift to make room for you. He'll call you. He'll call you to come and do what you do best before you develop and master your gift. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then in chapter 16, moving over to our text. Chapter 16, our text, the scene shifts. It moves to the battlefield. It moves to the battle line. Where the army of Israel have assembled themselves for battle. And the Philistine army has assembled themselves for battle. And the only reason why the armies of Israel had assembled themselves is because the Philistines had assembled themselves. They got ready to come and attack Israel. So Israel got together and said, no, we got to stop this attack. Verse 3 of chapter 17 tells us that each army was facing off each other on opposite mountains, yes. separated by a valley. Now, I, I know the video predict, uh, uh, depicted that they were kind of close together, and that's why you can't get your theology from movies. Why it's very entertaining, and I like the clip, is it, it, isn't, it isn't particularly specific the way the scripture says how the battle was betrayed. The, the Philistines were on this mountain, and Israel was on this mountain, and there was a valley in the midst. The Bible tells us that the Philistine champion came out, and he begins to taunt the Israelites, telling the Israeli army, hey, come on and fight me. And it's interesting because this man is a man by the name of Goliath. And the writer of 1 Samuel begins to describe him to us. Mm -hmm. The Bible says how he is six cubits and a span tall, meaning he is basically close to 10 feet tall. He's a monster. Yeah. Nine feet, nine inches, some commentary tells us. And he has this, this bronze helmet on his head. And then he has this bronze uh, scaled arm and the armor on his body where it comes from his shoulder down to his about thighs. And then he has this, on his back, a javelin that has an iron tip to it. Uh -huh. On his legs, he has bronze shields on his legs. Yeah. And then he has this little person in front of him who carries a shield. Uh -huh. He is an intimidating foe. Uh -huh. he, he, is, he is a massive piece of humanity that wants a fight. Yeah. And he says, you know, send out somebody to fight me. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he says in verse 8. It says, why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you serve as a saw? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Goliath says, now listen, Israel, listen, listen, listen. Don't don't worry about the armies. You, you, we're going to keep the Philistine army over here. We're going to keep Israel armies over here. Just send me one man. Yeah. Just send me one man, and we can do mortal combat, head to head, hand to hand, fighting. We don't have to take your people out. You don't have to take our people out. I'm Goliath. Mm -hmm. I represent the Philistines. Right. Israel, send me a man to represent you. Right. Goliath says, if I kill him, you become our slaves. Oh, if, he, if he kills me, you rule over us. Mm -hmm. The Bible says when King Saul and all of Israel heard this message, yes. the Bible says they became dismayed. Yes. And, and greatly afraid. Dismayed meaning that they are very worried and discouraged. Yes. That's, that's a real problem when you're worried and and afraid? He wasn't going to do nothing. Nothing. Leave, leave him alone. And among the soldiers, among the soldiers of, of Israel, David's three eldest brothers are there among the soldiers. And one day, on the 40th day, the scripture tells us, Jesse sends David down to the battle. He sends him to the battle line, he sends him down with some food, some cheese, and some other stuff, some roasted grain. He says, bring this food to your brothers. Mm -hmm. And give some food also to the commanders. Yeah. And during this time of 40 days, there is no fighting. Mm -hmm. 
There's just the taunting of a bully. Yeah. There is there's the antagonization of this giant. And when David gets to the camp of Israel on the 40th day, he sees the army of Israel begin to gather. They begin to put themselves in, in battle array, in battle formation, and they begin to chant. They begin to chant their war cry. Oh, we about to go to war. Y'all been doing it for 40 days. Y'all ain't done war yet. Why y'all chant? Right? But they chant, right? We're going to go after this guy. And, and it all happens when, when David gets to the camp. He sees his brothers. The Bible says he runs to them. Yeah. Yeah. And as he begins to talk to his brothers, they're not like talking to your brothers. Mm -hmm. They're not like talking to family. Right. So he's talking to his brothers. And while he's talking, he begins to hear this rant by this giant. Yeah. He begins to hear Goliath begins to taunt the nation of Israel. And Goliath is coming up from the Philistine army. Now I want you to see something. Look at the progression of things. Because Goliath was bold. Because Goliath was not intimidated by the nation of Israel. He begins to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. While Israel is afraid and paralyzed, mm -hmm. their problem is actually moving closer to them. Yeah. While they are stationed and paralyzed. We can clearly see it in the scripture how Goliath moved from one place to the next place. Over in verse 4, it says how he came out of the Philistine army. Now remember, now they're on the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. In verse 8, he tells the army of Israel, he says, send the man down to me. Mm -hmm. Meaning he's came off of the mountain, now he's in the valley. Yes. Right. Yes. In verse 23, he says, it says he is coming up towards yes. them from the Philistine army. Yes. So this, this this giant, this massive person comes off the mountain to the valley, now he's on Israel territory. He's walking up the mountain. Yes. Right, right. The audacity of problems. Yes. To come after you when you are afraid. Mm -hmm. To seek you out to destroy your life when you're paralyzed by fear. Yeah. That's what happens when you don't deal with your problems. Come on, yeah. They come after you. You go and hide under the covers. Yeah. What a problem to have. <laughs> like he. Yeah. The problem, Goliath, gets closer and closer and closer. And I believe too many Christians, too many people who believe the gospel, Come on. believe the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, yes. have repented of their sins and made Christ their Lord are afraid of problems. Yes. Too many of us were playing defense, we should be playing offense. Yes. Too many of us were responding to life's issues when we should be attacking life's yes. issues. Yes. Yes. I believe we should attack problems when they're small. Yeah. Not when they're staring us in our face. Yeah. I think we should go after them. Why? Because we got God on our side. Yeah. We should be dealing with our finances before they get out of control. We should be dealing with our marital issues before somebody cheats. Yeah. We should be dealing with our kids before they get locked up. Yeah. Dealing with our studies long before the test yeah. comes. Yeah. Learning to be proactive instead of reactive. There you go. That's the children of God. Yes. Yes. So when David hears the words of Goliath, right, he sees the army begin to retreat. Israel, they're moving back from the battle line. David begins to ask questions. And this is the first time David speaks in scripture. In verse 26, he begins to ask questions. He begins to say, what would happen to the man who defeats him? How would he be rewarded? And they begin to tell him he's going to be rich. He's going to marry one of the princesses, right? The taxes are going to be taken away from his house and his father's house. And then listen to what he says. Who is this uncircumcised prince that should taunt the armies of God? Can you hear the disdain in his voice? Yeah. Who is this joker? Yeah. To think he can come against the armies of yeah. God. Yeah. Who is this uncovenant Philistine? Yeah. Who is this man who thinks he can talk this way to the people of God? Yeah. Yeah. He's talking this way. 
because it's the people of God, and we talk to the people of God like that, you're not just talking about them, you're talking about their God. Amen. David, this, this young boy, this teenage boy, has more sense than the king of Israel. Amen. This teenage boy has more sense than all of the armies of Israel. This teenage boy understands something that Israel and Goliath evidently don't understand. Amen. That Israel has the covenant. Yes. Israel yes. is the people of God. Yes. And when they fight, they're God's fight. Oh, Israel is not the army of Saul. They are the army of God. Yeah. They were looking at the battle from a physical perspective. Yes. He's huge. He's massive. He's ten feet tall. He's a freaking nature. Go away. Yes. That's what they're looking. And David is saying, it's spiritual, no. He can think of the time, no. Yeah. 
understand now. There's just a lot of stuff happening in the wilderness that y'all don't know about on this battlefield. There's lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, in the wilderness. And whenever a lion came to attack the sheep, I beat his tail. Whenever a bear came to try to eat one of the sheep, I killed it. And then the lion, he was just like on the wild ass. I believe that your past prepared you for your present. I totally believe that the things that you have gone through and what God has brought you through has prepared you for your now. Your experience has not been wasted. Amen. Some of us look over our lives and say, all of that time I spent on that. Yeah. And look where I'm at now. Yeah. That time was preparation, not wasted time. Yeah. That, right. that time was training for the now and for your future. Yeah. Yeah. So Saul says, all right, David, you good. You want to go fight? Right. Put on his armor. <laughs> fight the way I want you. Find the one that makes me feel comfortable sending you out there. Yeah. David tries on the armor. He can barely walk in this guy. <laughs> I mean, it's huge. He's a teenager, and saw so army they are grown men. David says, I can't use this. I haven't proven them. I haven't tested them. I haven't practiced. I haven't been trained. Saul, it is good advice, but it doesn't work for that. So Saul, it is, it's a great strategy, but it won't work for me. Saul, I know the process is good. It's like y'all usually do things, Saul, but guess what? That ain't going to work for me. I wasn't trained that way. Right. Now, if you are going to let me fight, Saul, I'm going to fight the way I want. Yes. Otherwise, you put on the armor and you go fight. Yes. Don't send me out there to fight and do it your way. If you want me to fight, so guess what? Yes. I don't do it my way. Yes. Let me do what works, he's basically saying. Yeah. I know it doesn't make you feel comfortable, but God is trying to do this way. Yeah. I know it doesn't seem like it's so. But God is preparing you for this moment. Yeah. He's training me to be flexible. Mm -hmm. He's training me to be agile. That's why I can't have all that stuff on me. Okay. And he's training me to go into battle and to look after the sheep. It's not about everybody else. It's about the sheep. Yeah. That's how he's training me. Mm -hmm. David takes off the armor and he goes and he grabs the shepherd's staff. He goes to the brook and he grabs five smooth stones. And in his other hand, he takes his sling. Now the sling in the right hand is a deadly weapon. Amen. I know it seems simple. I, I know it doesn't seem very orthodox. With the right instrument in the right hand at the right time, it will kill something. David, when he walks out to battle, Bible says Goliath sees him, and he's been getting these to talk to him. Said, Bentley, this is what y'all say. <laughs> Underestimating someone of faith. Yes. Right. Underestimating someone who believes in the living God. Yeah. David tells Goliath, he says, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Yeah. You got weapons, I got God. He says, this day, I'm going to kill you, boy. Yeah. Owen's vernacular. But basically, you about to die. Yes. Today, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. David says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your hand off. And I'm going to kill all your boys, too. <laughs> David's a beast in a good way. Right? Yeah. He has this mentality. Nothing can stop me with God. Not you, not the armies. We don't go and defeat you. I believe bullies need to be stopped. They need to be stopped. I believe that, that, that you need to take your problems and you attack them with the faith and the perseverance of God. Yes. And 
why does David do it all of this? Why is he going to the battlefield? Why he has a sling? Why he has five rocks? All so that the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. Yeah. That's the only purpose of all this. And if it wasn't for God in the midst, David wouldn't be out there. Amen. If it wasn't for God tugging at his heart, he wouldn't be in this mess. Yeah. David wanted God to be glorified. Yes, he did. David wanted God's name to become more famous. Yeah. Yeah. In verse 47, David says, The Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David knew a secret that every warrior for Christ must know. Every soldier in Christ must know this secret. Not about David. Amen. Not about you. Amen. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. While David had the fight in the fight, the battle was not his. Amen. The fight wasn't his. It was all the Lord's. <laughs> when the church is going through, when the church has been facing, Amen. it is not your fight. Amen. Even though you have to fight in the fight, it's right. not your fight. Amen. The fight belongs to the Lord. Yes. Because when it's all said and done, you won't get the credit. Yeah. God will. Yeah. When it's all said and done, when, when the victory has been awarded and you have been celebrating God, you must say the battle was the Lord's. Yeah. He did it. He got the credit, not me. Yeah. I'm just a man with a sling. David, the Bible says, he ran down to the rock. For a man who ain't afraid of running after what God says. He ran after Goliath. Yeah. He yeah. took the sling. He took the sling. He got one rock and he took that thing yes. right, right yeah. between the headlights. Yeah. And then off the cliff, it says, it shows how, his, how, the, uh, how the rock bounced off his head. The Bible says it went into his head. Oh. Right. Yes. Like a bullet from a gun. Yeah. God took a, a, a very insignificant weapon and then put a little insignificant rock inside of it, and God used that to destroy the opposition. The Bible says how Goliath fell face first into the ground. And David, he ran over there, he took his, his, his short Goliath sword, not his took Goliath sword out of his sheath, took it, and cut the giant's head off. <laughs> and when the armies of the Philistines saw this, <laughs> they said, yeah, you know what? That kind of stuff that he was all talking about, that's <laughs> They fled. <laughs> they ran. <laughs> the Bible says, the nation of Israel, the armies of Israel, began to chase after them, yeah. slaughtering them all the way back to their home. That moment changed David's life forever. From that moment, he was no longer a shepherd. He was a warrior in the army of God. That was a defining moment that took him from the sheepfold into the palace. That very moment. And while that moment was very amazing, while that moment was, was, was outright courageous, it was not as courageous as the son. It was not as courageous as Jesus fighting that which is most amazingly impossible Amen. to stop. Yes. Sin, death, hell, and the grave. David beats Goliath. Jesus beats the devil, the devil, and the devil. David used Goliath's hand, used Goliath's sword to call his hand. Jesus used death and the grave to bring down the Amen. devil. Amen. David yeah. stop Israel from being slave of the Philistines. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. Stops people from being slaves to sin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in 
if you are here today and you don't know Jesus, the Bible says that you are in sin or that you are in bondage to sin. Right. Yeah. Right. The Bible says without Jesus, you are destined for hellfire. Yes. 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 Amen. But today you can change your destiny yes, sir. by changing by what you believe. Yes, sir. Right. Believe what the Bible says about everybody, even Pastor Steve. He's a sinner and needs a savior. Amen. Everybody needs a savior because they're sinners destined for hellfire for breaking God's law. Yes. Believe. Gospel. Amen. That God loves you so much, He sent His only Son to die for you. Yes. He sent His Son to shed His blood, to get on the cross, yes. to be nailed to a stinking cross, yes. to be placed in a tomb that wasn't even His, yes. to die for three days, being in the grave. Coming back three days later with all power in His hands. Amen. Believe that message. Yes. Your eternity will change. Yes. You will go from darkness to lightness. You go from heaven to hell. You go from a sinner to a sinner saved by grace. Yes. Yes. Repent of your sin. Yes. 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 Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes. Yes. And you can be a part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. Yes, it is. Yes. Give your life to Jesus Amen. today. You don't know about tomorrow. Matter of fact, you don't know about the next second. Believe now. Hurry up. Amen. Amen.